Okay, hi. So um, today I'm going to be talking about um, our recent work on fraud proofs. But before I explain what fraud proofs are, let's talk about the motivation behind them and what are the current uh, trade-offs that we have in blockchains. So as we all know, or some of, or at least many of us might know, um, at the moment there exists a very large trade-off between decentralization and on-chain scalability of blockchains. So that is to say that the more transactions per second that your blockchain could do on-chain, the more resources that full nodes need to actually process these transactions. And that means it becomes more expensive to run a full node. So less and less people will run full nodes and then only people with large data centers or with large amounts of resources can run full nodes to actually download the blockchain to um, actually verify these transactions and make sure that the, 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 the chain that they're on is the correct chain. And so if you increase the transactions per second, less people can run full nodes and then you have more centralization. And effectively, instead of running full nodes, people will have to run instead um, light clients and these are clients that don't download every block or don't download all the, they, they, they don't download the, uh, all the transactions in the block. And instead, they simply assume that the majority of the consensus in your chain is honest. So as in that there's no 51% attack. Because if there was a 51% attack, then a, a malicious miner could create blocks effectively that contain invalid transactions that do things like create money out of thin air. Full nodes, if you're running a full node, your node will, re will reject that block. So you can't be tricked into thinking that there's money being created out of thin air. But if you're running a light client that isn't actually validating the blocks, then you could be tricked to thinking that a transaction exists that is actually invalid, where all the full nodes will actually reject that block. So, so the fundamental question that we want to ask ourselves, I think, is how can we make it possible for, the, for these non-fully validating nodes to actually also reject these uh, invalid blocks so that they too don't have to trust the miners and they, they don't have to assume that the majority of the consensus is, is honest. And um, we can use fraud proofs to do this. So this uh, talk is based on a paper. Um, the link, is, uh, link, link, link on the code is on the um, slide. And this was a joint research project with Alberto from UCL and Vitalik from Ethereum Research. So to recap how light clients and full nodes work. So um, full nodes, to recap, full nodes are basically nodes that actually download the entire blockchain, including the actual transactions themselves. And light clients only actually download the headers of these blocks. So they don't, they don't actually download this transaction data. And the idea of fraud proofs is that if a full node downloads this, these transactions and notices that one of these transactions violate the protocol rules, because they might, for example, be generating money out of thin air or might be uh, referencing invalid tr unspent transaction outputs or transaction outputs that have already been spent, then that full node could generate a fraud proof or some, or some kind of proof that this block contains an invalid transaction and send this proof to, to, to light clients so that light clients can reject this block. And um, the original Bitcoin white paper actually mentions this briefly as an idea. It mentions something called alerts. And the idea of alerts are basically messages that full nodes can use. I mean, that full, they're basically messages that full nodes can actually send to light clients to basically alert them that a block is invalid. And the idea is that once a full node is alerted, alerts a light client that a, node is, uh, a block is invalid, then the light client will effectively re-download the entire block to see if it's valid or not. But the problem with this is that as a full node, I could just tell you to download every single block because I could say every block is invalid. And, and so then it's basically vulnerable to a denial of service attack because in the worst case scenario, your light client would have to effectively download every block. 
So, you're, so that in, worst, in, in the worst case scenario, the performance of your light client effectively degrades down back to a full node again. And that's, that, that, defeats the point, that defeats the purpose. And um, people have also proposed this idea of compact fraud proofs, where instead of full nodes alerting light clients to download the entire block, they could incent, send them a compact proof that some specific transaction in that block is invalid. But many of these early proposals, they require a different fraud proof for every single way to violate a protocol rule. So for example, you might have one fraud proof for double spend, you might have one fraud proof um, for a miner taking too many fees, and so on and so forth. But we can improve on this and, and we can simplify it significantly to make it so that you only need one unified generalized fraud proof to actually uh, prove that some transaction was invalid in the block. And the way that we do this is that we effectively generalize the blockchain as a state transition system, which, is what, which are what systems like Ethereum do already. So if you imagine that at block X, the blockchain is at state one, and then at block X plus one, the, the blockchain is at some different state, then effectively all the transactions in block X plus one, they all modify the state of the blockchain in some way if you apply these transactions sequentially until you get this final state in this next block. And then let's suppose we have this state transition function that can return the new state or an error if you input the, the old state and some transaction. So the goal of a fraud proof is what if there's a, some transaction here in the block that modifies the state in some invalid way? So you basically want a way to succinctly prove that this is the case. And so we, effect we basically need a way to represent the entire state of the blockchain very succinctly, for example, as a Merkle root. So we can imagine the state of the blockchain to be a, a key value store. In the case of Bitcoin, that would, for example, be the keys would be UTXO IDs, and the value could be one if they're unspent or zero if, if otherwise, if they're already spent or non-existent, for example. And at the moment, Ethereum uses um, Patricia Shree to do this. But recently, there has been um, more popularity in using a new construct called the Sparse Merkle Tree to do this. And Ethereum 2.0 is actually um, planning to switch to this new construct. And the idea of a Sparse Merkle Tree is that it's basically a normal Merkle Tree with a very large number of leaves. So for example, if you wanted to represent every single possible SHA-256 hash, you would have two to the power of 256 leaves. So an insanely, amount, insanely large amount of number of leaves. And you might be wondering how is it even possible to, gen to generate a Merkle tree with that many leaves? And the key trick is that you basically, basically you know that most of the leaves in this tree will have the default value or will be uninitialized to some default value like zero. And so if you know that most of the leaves in this, in this tree have the value of zero, then you can pre-compute already most of the intermediate values in this tree because you, because you, you know that most, most of the intermediate nodes in this tree will only have leaves that have the default value of zero. And so let's suppose if you wanted to access some key k in a tree, then you basically take the hash of k and then you look up that index in the tree so for example, if hash of k is one, then you look up index one, and that will be the value of the key. And so using this method, you can ex effectively represent the entire state of the blockchain um, in a single Merkle root. And what you can basically do is publish this Merkle root in every single block header to have a representation of the entire uh, state in the uh, block header. Okay, this. I don't know, this, uh, these slides haven't come out very well here, but effectively the idea is that, so in the previous slide, I've mentioned that the blockchain is a state, transi state transition system, but here we can represent it as a state root transition system, because if we include this root in every block header, then we can basically say, after every single transaction that you apply in this block, it changes the root of the state in some way. 
and effectively what this creates is basically an execution trace so if you if you include all of these intermediate state routes in the block or after every single transaction then you basically have a cryptographic execution trace of how to get from block x from the state of block x to the state of block x plus one So, in, so then let's suppose that, wait, sorry, one sec. Yeah, that was one of these slides. So let's suppose that um, this transaction here is invalid and, in, and modifies the state in some invalid way. Then the fraud proof effectively becomes this. The fraud proof effectively becomes the pre-state root, the post-state root, and the transaction itself and also the Merkle roots of all those things in the uh, from the block header. And if you give a light client all of these things, then a light client can effectively uh, run this transition function to check if you if you execute this transaction here on this state root, do you get this state root or do you get something else? If you get something else or if you get an error then that means the fraud proof is valid and the light client can actually reject the block. You also need to provide the light client the witnesses of the transaction. And the witnesses of the transaction are basically the Merkle proofs of all of the parts of the state that the transaction accesses. So now that we have basically have a way to for like for full nodes to compact to succinctly tell light clients uh, that a transaction is invalid and prove it, we effectively now have a fraud proof system that can be generalized to any kind of blockchain model, whether it be a UTXO based model or an account based model like Ethereum. But the problem with this system so far is that what happens if a miner mines some new block but doesn't actually release the, the data behind that block? So they might, for example, publish the header of the block, but they might not publish the, the transaction data itself. And so the light client might get these headers, but the full nodes can't actually get this, get this data. So then it will be actually impossible to generate a fraud proof. So what we need effectively is a way for these light clients to have some kind of assurance that this transaction data is actually available to the network so that they know that a full node could come along and download this data and send them a fraud proof if the transaction data was invalid. And the way that we can actually prove this to light clients is by using a technique called erasure coding. So the idea of erasure coding is that you can have a piece of data or some blob of data that is X pieces big and you can basically blow up this data to two X pieces. And so you get this original data and then you blow up it to two X pieces and you get this extended data. And what you can do is you can basically recover the entire original data from any X pieces of the extended data. So let's suppose like you lose half the data here. You can recover the entire data from any X pieces or from any half of data, no matter what order they're in, or no, no matter what part of the um, blob they're in. So what we can build with this is we can basically require miners to commit to the Merkle root of the erasure-coded version of the block. So instead of just committing to the Merkle root of transactions, you have to actually commit to the Merkle root of the erasure-coded version of the data containing the transactions. And then what this basically does is it converts the problem from a 100% data availability problem to a 50% data availability problem. And so if a miner needs to hi wants to hide or make missing any piece of the data or of block, then they have to hide at least half the block. So, let, let, so let's suppose like in this block that contains one transaction in like 50, 100 bytes that is invalid and generates a billion dollars out of thin air. In order for a miner to hide 
ju just 100 bytes from the block. They would actually have to hide half of the entire block. And so, if we assume that a miner is doing this kind of attack, and they actually have hidden half of the block, then clients can randomly sample different pieces of the block. And then, during the first sample, there will be a 50% chance that they will la land on a piece of data that is unavailable or that has not been released by the miner. And if the client randomly samples or asks the network for a part of the block that is unavailable, then the, then the client won't receive a response for the sample. And if the client doesn't receive a response for the sample re request, then they will not accept the block because they, they don't know that it's available or they assume that it's not available. And so after every single sample, you can significantly increase the probability of landing on an unavailable block or an unavailable piece, assuming that half the data is hidden. So after S samples, you have a one minus two to the power of minus S chance. And when clients sample these different pieces, they gossip these different pieces to full nodes. And once the network has access to 50% of the data, then cl that clients can gossip these th pieces to the full nodes, and the full nodes can actually recover the entire block and generate a fraud proof of it. Now, this scheme only works if there's a sufficient number of light clients that are making enough samples to reconstruct the whole data. So like if there's only one client and they've only sampled one piece, then obviously that's not enough data to reconstruct the entire block. And we'll analyze that in a moment. So the problem with the scheme I've described so far is that what happens if the miner incorrectly generates the extended data? So you have this original data, and they're supposed to extend this data using an erasure coding algorithm, but they might just insert gibberish here so this might this might not be real data, and this might this might be fraudulent data. The problem with that is that if you wanted to prove to a light client that this extended data was incorrectly generated, then basically the light client would have to re-download the entire original data and and compute the extended data itself to check if it's correct or not. And that's basically back to square one, because the size of this fraud proof would basically be equivalent to the size of the block, which is back to Satoshi's alert system again. So we need to s find a way to make this more efficient. What we can do to make this more efficient is use multi-dimensional erasure coding. And the idea of multi-dimensional erasure coding is that you arrange the original data into a square, and then you extend the square into a bigger square, and so you extend the rows and columns individually. And so then that means if the miner incorrectly generated the extended data, the, the, all, you have to, all you need to do to prove that that data was incorrectly uh, generated is the light client needs to download only, only one of the rows or columns of that square and then, and then extend it to check if the extended data is correct or not. So then, now we have a full proof that is of size O square root of the block size, and that's much better. You can also go higher dimensions, so you can have three-dimensional or four-dimensional erasure coding, but then you get different trade-offs that you have to consider. And in this, in this two-dimensional scheme, the miner has to hide roughly 25% of the block to hide any one piece in the block. So then here we can analyze what is the probability of a client landing on at least one, one unavailable piece. I think I should say unavailable rather than available. But what is the probability that they la land on at least one unavailable piece if the miner has hidden 25% uh, of the square? And we, we basically want this probabil probability to be as high as possible because the higher this probability, the lower the chance of um, a light client being fooled by a miner that a block is available when it's actually not available. 
So we can see after three samplings, we get a 60% chance of um, not being fooled. And after 15 samplings, we get a 99% chance. So we can get very high probability guarantees that a uh, block is actually available without needing to download the entire block. And 99% might seem like a very low probability because that still means like in one in 100 cases you can be fooled. But in practice, if you look at this from an economic perspective, it's actually a decent, amount, decent amount of security because that means in order to fool a specific light client, on average, you would have to mine 100 blocks before you can actually fool a different light client. Uh, fool a different fool a light client. So that basically increases the cost of the attack by 100 times. If you if you wanted a high probability, you can get 99.99. 99.99% uh, with 30 samples. So there's also a subtle attack that you can do with the scheme. So a miner could effectively only release pieces of the block as clients ask for them. And what that means is that miner could always pass the sampling challenge of the first few or the first m clients that ask for samples. And how many of these clients can be fooled depends on how many samples they make each and how wide the square is. It's like for example, if each client makes 10 samples and it's a, it's a 32 by 32 square, then the first 500 clients can be tricked. So that, that can either be good or bad depending on how you look at it. So for example, right now there's a, there's a million Bitcoin wallets uh, installed on Android using the Bitcoin wallet application. So from that perspective, 500 isn't a lot. But ideally, we don't want any, any light clients to be fooled. So the way that you can prevent that is by assuming a different network model. And we can assume that light clients could actually send these requests anonymously. And we can assume that the, that the order in which these requests are received by a network are uniformly random. So like for example, you can send them over a mixed net or you can, or light clients can send the requests all at the same time. And that basically makes it so that miners or the network can't link different samplings to, to, to the same client. And so that means they can't selectively release different samples to specific clients to, sport, to, to trick the first few clients into thinking that the block is available when it's not. So now let's analyze uh, the security assumptions of the scheme. So let's suppose that full nodes at the moment, um, they don't require any additional security assumptions to reject invalid blocks or to accept to know that a block is valid because full nodes actually download the block themselves and check that the transactions are valid or not. Now with SPV client, SPV clients assume that the majority of the consensus is honest. and if we add fraud proof to this, we can eliminate this one assumption and replace it with these three assumptions. And that might look worse, but it's actually much better because these three assumptions are much weaker security assumptions than this assumption here. So the first assumption is that we assume that there's at least one honest full node in the network. And I think that's a very big assumption because if there's no honest full node in, in, the, net, in the entire network, the network's pretty much dead and no one's actually using the network. The second assumption is that we assume that there's some maximum network delay to receive these proofs. So once you're a light client and you, and you see the header, then you might wait, for example, like five minutes to see if a fraud proof come, comes along or not. And uh, if it does, then you reject the block. And I think that's a fairly reasonable assumption as well. And I think it depends on how um, your block interval. For example, t Bitcoin's block interval is 10 minutes. So if you assume conservatively a delay of five minutes, then that seems like a quite, quite a reasonable assumption. And the third assumption, which is the heaviest assumption, is that you need the, you need, you need the minimum number of light clients in the network for this to work at all. And usually about a few hundred. Considering that Bitcoin has about 1 million SPV wallets installed on Android phones, um, at least if your cryptocurrency has actual users, then that's also a reasonable assumption. 
And these three assumptions are much weaker assumptions than this assumption. Because if we start running into a situation where everyone's running SPV clients instead of full nodes because blocks are so big and there's, there's so many transactions per second, then you've effectively created a situation where it's much more profitable to do a 51% attack. At the moment, the only thing you can do with a 51% attack is reverse transactions or sensor transactions and do a double spend attack. That's not as profitable as, say, for example, generating new value transactions that generate a lot of money after there or stealing other people's money. So we also implemented this. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on the uh, on the specific numbers, but you can see everything is quite efficient. So all the fraud proofs themselves are like a, a few kilobytes. And also from a, from a computational perspective, everything is quite efficient as well in terms of verifying and generating stuff is in the magnitude of, of milliseconds. So thanks for listening. Uh, the, paper, the full LF paper is here if you want to check it out. I'll, I'll take some questions. Yeah, let's play for a microphone. Is there a microphone coming up? Uh, so if I understand uh, your work correctly, so I see like you were trying to tackle denial of service attacks from a full node where he does not provide the information to a SB, uh, like light client, right? Right. So instead of uh, like in, in, in solution to this, you say we will extend the block into 2x, like from x to 2x, so that we can sample x elements from that and then reconstruct the block, right? Right. Yeah. So, so I, I don't see any performance improvement here because earlier the block size was x and you make it 2x and you ask them to download x. So instead, why don't you ask them to download the original block? Like so we're not, we're not asking light clients to download x. The light clients only download a few pieces of that block. So they sample that block. So if you remember here, if you look at this graph here, here, the light client can be 99% sure that the block is available without downloading X pieces. They only need to download 15 pieces. 15 right. pieces from, but uh, from the 15 pieces, how do they reconstruct the original data? Because if I understand, oh, like right. in laser coding, you have to have the entire information to validate that yeah. the, yeah. Right, but the li so the light clients in individually themselves, they don't, they don't download X pieces. But the light clients together, they download more than X pieces. So they have to communicate with other light clients to like, I'm just trying to understand how, yeah. the, how the reconstruction works so that I can actually first validate right. that the eraser coding was correct and then yeah. later validate the transaction. So, so the light clients uh, download different pieces of block and they gu gossip these pieces to the full nodes if they ask for them. So if the full node doesn't have a piece, they can ask for them and it's the full nodes to actually reconstruct the block, not the light clients. And yeah, since it's originally denied of service by full node, yeah, the, uh, the full node can simply decide, they'll say that I won't give any samples to you. Then, then in that case, what happens? Like, like well, if the full node doesn't give, if the client asks for samples, and the client doesn't receive any samples, then the light client will not accept that block, and will assume that that block is unavailable. But in practice, light clients aren't only connected to one full node. They're connected to multiple full nodes. And light clients make the assumption that they're connected to at least one honest full node. If they're not connected to any honest full nodes, then they're basically um, under what's called an eclipse attack. And they're on a different view of the network. I, I understand this. Like, yeah. uh, further, maybe. Uh, so if you collect samples, and if you have incorrect information in the block, and then how do you uh, go from the samples, like if you have partial information, how do you know that in which part of the block there was error, and you have to actually sample appropriately to generate that part of the block, right? Like if the, if the transaction error is in the first part of the block, like first few transactions, uh, right. and then and you sample, like you sample enough that you, you can only generate the later part of the block, yeah. then it doesn't help, right? So the light client also has to identify from the samples that it has to collect information of the initial few bytes of the block. Yeah, but it's not it's not it's not the light clients that are generating their fraud proofs. It's the full nodes that are generating their fraud proofs. 
and they're generating that fraud proofs when they have the full block. So if they don't have the full block, then they can't generate the fraud proofs. But they, only, they can only generate, the formula generate the fraud proofs once they receive enough samples from light clients. I, I think I'll take it offline maybe. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll be around. Okay. Yeah. Okay.